Get your ears wrapped around the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. All the scoop you need to know from college basketball to the NBA and even March Madness. News of your rising stars. Topics on and off the hardwood. This is the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast. Hello and thank you for tuning in to the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host as always, Isaiah Kidos. In today's podcast, we'll break down the two games that happened before the All-Star festivities. And then we'll dive into the Rising Stars game, the skills competition, the three-point contest, the dunk competition, before breaking down the All-Star game and its new format. So let's get into it. The, one of the uh, two games that happened before we went into the All-Star break was the Boston Celtics versus the Los Angeles Clippers. As a reminder, this was one of the games I predicted, I had a prediction for. Um, either way, though, this is a fantastic matchup. A potential finals matchup if somehow you know they can beat the Lakers and they can beat the Bucks. Those are the two favorites, of course, because they're both first in their respective conferences as of right now. But I definitely can see Boston finding a way to beat the Bucks and f- and get their way into the NBA Finals. The Clippers have all the tools they need to to be a great team in the West and take down the Lakers. So who knows? This could be the NBA Finals matchup. So seeing these two go head to head in the regular season is super fun to see. Both teams at the time are coming off a loss, so both of them looking for a bounce back win. The Celtics' loss had just came after a seven game win streak, so even more so for them, they want to get right back into their winning ways. After having such a great winning streak, um, I think the Celtics on one end are just a lot more consistent than the Clippers have been this year. Clippers have had a lot of injuries, a lot of different starting lineups, probably the team with the most starting lineups throughout the first half of the season. And so you can put that up for excuses for them. Um, But at the end of the day, you got to get the job done. I think the Celtics have had a few injuries as well. Jalen Brown's gone now, Marcus Smart's gone out, Kemba Walker's been out with some injuries, so they've had their own kind of struggles, but they've been more consistent in my opinion. Tatum and Kemba Walker in their last game had really poor outings. Both didn't shoot the ball well at all from a percentage standpoint, and definitely weren't up to their standards in terms of their point output in their game. So I definitely saw that 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 would not happen again. That was my prediction for this game. I also said that if Gordon Hayward can continuously score 20 points for them, they're going to be a dangerous team, and who's going to stop them? And in this game, spoiler alert, Gordon Hayward does drop 20 points, so we'll see how that lands. Um, I really just was wondering who's going to keep up with them from the Clippers. I just think that the Celtics just had a little more pieces than the Clippers did, and plus the Clippers had just lost the 76ers, who... I think are even more inconsistent than the Clippers have been. So for them to lose to them, kind of interesting to see. And another Eastern Conference team, if they lose the Sixers, I feel like they should lose to the Celtics. That was kind of just my predictions, my you know recap of, of this matchup. It's going to be tough, though, for the Celtics in this game because they don't have Jalen Brown. He's a big piece for them, but he was out in this one with a left calf contusion. Marcus Smart would start in place for him. And after the Celtics were in a hole early on in the game, he was actually the one that helped them out of it. He scored the first 10 points for the Celtics. So that's a good person to plug into the lineup and have, you know, be productive. Because obviously he's coming off the bench usually. He's got a great six-man role, the person for that second unit. But he can plug into the starting lineup and not miss a beat. He and Tatum both combined for 24 points of the Celtics' 30 total points in the first quarter. After that first quarter, it was the Clippers who were up by two, mostly due to Kawhi having 15 points. But early in the second quarter, disaster struck for the Clippers. And I mean disaster. Paul George went down injuring his left hamstring, and he would not return to this game. 
that's a huge, huge blow for the Clippers. Obviously, that's their second best player if you count Kawhi being better than Paul George. That's up for discussion. But having him go down is a huge blow to your team, not even not only on the offensive end, but on the defensive end as well. He's one of the best two guards in the league. And so having him go down with another injury this year, really tough to see. Hopefully he can stop being so injury prone so that this team can gain some more consistency and have more consistent lineups. George was already struggling in this game. He was two for seven from the field, only had four points. But either way, losing that big of a piece, that's basically a walking 20 points right there. Super tough. Boston turned the tides, obviously, in this quarter um, with Walker scoring 11 points, and they took the lead 60 to 58 in this in this quarter and going into halftime. So they held on and extended their lead in the third before a really big fourth quarter by who else? But Lou Williams brought them back closer. I had said in the last podcast, Lou Will would go off and have a great game. And that's typical for Lou. Coming off the bench, he's sixth man of the year, every year, because he's just that good and that consistent. And he knows his role extremely well. So when you see that Paul George going down, he knew he had to step up, and that's exactly what he did. The game was tied with two at with two and a half to go, and Jason Tatum hit a huge three to give the Celtics a three-point lead. And after Lou hit a nice fadeaway to cut it to one, Tatum had a nice fadeaway of his own to push it back up to three with one and a half left. Then, with 51 seconds left, Kawhi went for the tying three and missed. But, Mark Morris came up with a huge offensive board, kept it alive, kicked it out, and then he relocated. He didn't just stop. Once you kick it out, usually some players just stop and don't move, but he relocated up to the top of the key. He ended up getting the ball back to him. And he hit a three himself, tying the game at 114 with 45 left. Kemba pulled up from the elbow as the clock hit zero, but the score remained tied. So it headed to overtime. Tatum and Smart had all 13 points in the first overtime for the Celtics. That's crazy. That's how you put a team on your back. The lead would change a few times, but down the wire, it was the Celtics up three with 23 seconds left. So it looks like they're about to close out this game. Shamit would get an inbounds pass and dribble around the three-point arc before pulling up and knocking down a three to tie it up again. Tatum had a step back three with the clock running down to zero, but it wouldn't fall, so then it would go to double overtime. The first bucket of this one was a beauty by Kemba. If you haven't seen it yet, check it out. This is a move you want to show kids to practice in the driveway. He was driving to the lane before putting it between his legs and stepping back, leaving Shamit running to the rim by himself while Kemba knocked down a three. It was a nasty move, great move. Just shows his handles and his ability to stop on a dime and knock it down. Celtics would extend their lead to five, and with 53 seconds remaining, Lou Williams drove to the lane and got rejected by Gordon Hayward. And then a little later, Hayward ended up getting a steal on an inbounds pass to Lou Williams, effectively icing the game so not only are they getting it done on the offensive end but they also got it done on the defensive end as well icing this game on the defensive end you don't see that a lot not as often you see daggers being put in to where you know it just puts the lead too far for a team to recover but getting it done on the defensive end too is the makes of a championship team and to see it come from gordon hayward as well is just another added bonus If he continues playing well and continues getting confidence, this Celtics team can be really scary. So they end up taking this game 141 to 133. The Clippers fall in double OT. The Clippers were led by Lou Williams once Paul George went down. And Lou Williams in this game had 35 points, 6 rebounds, and 8 assists with a steal and 2 blocks. So this loss cannot be put on him by any means. He put the team on his back, did everything he could, got it done. On across the whole stat line so played really well Kawhi as well really good numbers 28 points 11 boards four assists with a block and a steal and then Montrez Hero as well another person with great numbers 24 points 13 boards three assists two steals and three blocks this is why I think that the Clippers can be an all defensive team because they just have players that get it done all over the floor Two steals and three blocks combined with a double-double. It's a great outing from Harrell. Shamit had 19, and the Morris had 10 points, 8 boards, and 2 assists with 2 blocks. So 
he did add a little bit to this to the squad but i think that over time when morris becomes more comfortable in this team and in their rotations and he learns his role a little bit more i think his scoring output would definitely go up all the starters for the celtics on the other hand all of them in double figures great outing for every single one of them tatum like i said bounce back game in a big way for him 39 points and nine boards 39 points that's a great response after having a shooting a poor shooting performance so he put the team on his back iced the game a couple of times and he said he likes that added pressure he says he wants to be as calm as possible but sometimes when he hits those big shots he gets very excited and good on him marcus smart as well starting in the place of jalen brown like i said before stepped in and stepped up 31 points four rebounds three assists with four steals so he was getting done all over the floor. Gordon Hayward as well, 21 points. Like I said, this guy consistently scores 20 points. This Celtics team is going to be dangerous, not, not to mention the fact that he got it done defensively too in crunch time. He had 21 points, 13 boards, and 4 assists. Kemba Walker had 19 points, 9 rebounds, and 7 assists, so he got it done all over the floor. Didn't really need that high outpouring of scoring that he usually has because Marcus Smart and Tatum both went off. And then Thies had... 12 points, 5 rebounds with 2 blocks. So every single one of the starters in double figures, all of them very productive. The Celtics are still in third as of right now, but they've won 7 in a row at home, and they won 8 of their last 9 games. So they're on a roll playing really well right now, and it's tough for them to be stopped, especially against, and even against a team like the Clippers, who are one of the best teams in the West, probably one of the best teams in the NBA on their good day. Clippers have not been playing without Beverly because he's been injured out for a couple games, and now Paul George too. So they need to get healthy. They need to get some more consistency amongst their team. And once they do that, they can be a very, very dangerous squad. That was one of the two games played on Thursday leading up to All-Star Weekend. So we take a look at that next game coming up next. Are you looking for the very best NFL and college football podcast? Then check out the GSMC Football Podcast. Get the latest football news both on and off the field. From the NFL draft to trades to the rumor mill to the NFL combines. They got you covered. That's gsmcpodcast.com backslash football dash podcast. Get updates on college rivalries, game day insights, and much, much more. It's football talk the way you want it. This show eats, sleeps, and breathes football. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit gsmcpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about the Boston Celtics taking on the Los Angeles Clippers and it being a total battle to the very, very end. And when I say very end, it took a while to get there. It was a double overtime game in which Jason Tatum had a fantastic outing, 39 points. Marcus Smart, too, starting in place of the injured Jalen Brown. He had 31 and. The Clippers losing Paul George in the second quarter really hurt hurt them. In the end, they just couldn't hold on, even though Lou Williams had a great game, had a team-high 35 points. Um, but yeah, injuries plague, plagued the Clippers. Don't have Beverly. Lost Paul George in this one. And it was a tough way for them to try and bounce back and find a way to win. And against a good Celtics team that's won eight of their last nine, seven in a row at home, it's a tough tough situation for them to be in. But if they get healthy... They can be very dangerous. And so that was one game that happened on Thursday leading up to All-Star break. The other one being the Oklahoma City Thunder versus the New Orleans Pelicans. Both teams, in my opinion, are very much wild cards in the West right now. Because the New Orleans Pelicans have a lot of talent, a lot of potential for them. Right now they're sitting in 11th place in the West. So they're a few spots out of a playoff spot. They are four and a half back, actually. No, excuse me. They're five and a half back from a playoff spot. Um, and I think they're a team that can definitely squeeze in there. The Oklahoma City Thunder, another team that a lot of people weren't expecting to be as good as they are. 
They're in sixth place right now, just past the Dallas Mavericks for the sixth seed. And they're a team that's been very surprising this season, mostly because Chris Paul has been revitalized. And then Gallinari is having a great year. Shea Gilgis Alexander is having a breakout year. So there's a lot of pieces going on right now to make this Thunder team dangerous. And they showed it even more in this game as well. Chris Paul, like I said, been fantastic. Pelicans on a three-game win streak. And Zion coming off a career night, 31 points. I said that he would probably go off, which, spoiler alert, he does. I also said if Ingram isn't playing in this one, they probably won't win. (laughs) But then I switched up and said, either way, I'm going to stick with the Pelicans because they've just been the team I've gone with a lot during these predictions. And they never really steered me wrong. You know, They were just the team I always rooted for. And so I was saying how no one would be able to guard Zion. They couldn't. And that he would have a great night. He did. Um, I also thought Drew Holiday would limit Chris Paul. Um, He didn't necessarily do that. I'll explain later. Um, Zoe being productive, getting over 10 assists. He doesn't do that. Spoiler alert. Um, I was about 50-50 on these guesses. So let's just break down the game. This game would be very back and forth with 22 lead changes and 12 times the game was tied. The first quarter alone saw the two teams only separated by one point. In the second, the Thunder started to catch a groove, though. They shot 51.7% from the field and 45.5% from three, with 10 points from both Dennis Schroeder coming off the bench and Gallinari. So when I say they caught a groove, they definitely, definitely found ways to be productive. And especially in comparison to the way the Pelicans were shooting, they shot 38.9% from the field and 33.3% from the field, which by no means is terrible. It's not great, obviously, but compared to how the Thunder were shooting the ball, it just meant that they were down by a lot at halftime. And at the end of the half, to even put salt in the wounds, Chris Paul gave the ball up to Steven Adams, who threw the ball basically like a baseball from a little beyond half court and ended up nailing the shot to beat the buzzer. The big man then shimmied and smiled as that was his first career three-pointer. And he said uh, later on that it was pretty funny because he, they have like three-point contests or what have you in practice, and he hit that very shot to win that, that contest for practice. And so he, did, he carried it over and did it in the game as well, which is pretty funny. That gave them a 66-58 to 58 lead heading into halftime. So the Thunder up by eight. Good situation for them to be in. The Pelicans actually trailed by 13 at one point before making a push to get back into the game, and then they would eventually take the lead on Alonzo Ball three-pointer, taking the lead 111 to 110. But then when that happened, Gallinari, who had 11 of his 29 points in the fourth quarter, went on a run of his own, and the Thunder took control late in the game again, making it 121-115 with 30 seconds left, and it was garbage points from there the thunder would go on to win this one 123 to 118 and my prediction of the pelicans winning would be very wrong the pelicans just didn't have enough against a veteran team that has been rolling this year um and they've just been very clutch as well they they've been in the situation where they've been down a lot for most of the year and they would come back and win games or just fall that that little bit short but having the control for most of the game and having it close that late in the game and then having players like Gallinari, having Chris Paul, um, those veteran presence in crunch time, I think helped them edge a young Pelicans team that's still learning, still figuring it out for themselves. And I think that was the difference in this one. Um, Also, another big, big punctuation for the Pelicans and, and, and the reason why they lost is they had 17 turnovers that led to 24 points. And so that killed the Pelicans. Um, The Thunder have also won 15 of their last 18 road games. So they're just very consistent and been playing really confidently as well. This is the eighth game now out of 10 games for Zion where he scored at least 20 points and two of those times being 30 points. So he is an impressive player. Only 10 games so far each Eight of those, he scored 20 or more. That's crazy to me. Gallinari in this one, he was the real difference maker. 29 points, also added two steals. 
Dennis Schroeder off the bench, he had 22 points. Shea Gilgis Alexander had 17 points, 3 rebounds, and 7 assists. And then Chris Paul, like I said, I thought maybe he'd get slowed down by Drew Holiday. He he was a little bit, if you're talking about just points. Um, but the way that Chris Paul plays, you know, he doesn't necessarily need to score a lot of points to be as productive as he can be. His biggest thing is running an offense, and he does that like none other. So in this one, he had 14 points, 8 rebounds, and 12 assists. So he was getting it done in the assist column, really taking over late in the game. And then Steven Adams had a very quiet double-double with 11 points and 11 rebounds. Now for the Pelicans, like I said, they just didn't have enough. Their highest score in Brandon Ingram being injured and not being on the court definitely hurts them. J.J. Redick was their highest scorer with 24 points and two steals. Lonzo Ball, who I said would have a productive game, was pretty productive, um, but he didn't get the 10 assists, like I said. So he had 16 points, 6 rebounds, and 5 assists with 2 blocks. So, like I said, pretty productive. He does get it done um, over over the, the stat sheet. He does get a lot done, but not enough, obviously. Drew Holiday, 14 points, 6 rebounds, 11 assists. But Zion Williamson, he had just had a career-high night his last game, 31 points. And then this game... He gets a new career high, 32 points. He also had six boards with an emphatic block, volleyball-like. You should probably check it out. It's really cool to see. Um, And his legend just continues. I mean, after already pushing your career high to 31 the night before, you follow it up by pushing it by one more point. And so Zion is the first since Michael Jordan with 10 field goals and 10 free throws in consecutive games as a rookie. He's the first since Shaquille O'Neal with 20 points per game on 55% shooting in his first 10 games. He is first since Allen Iverson with multiple 30-point games within the first 10 games of his career. And he's the first since Luka Doncic with consecutive 30-point games as a teenager. He's in company with Michael Jordan, Shaq, Allen Iverson, and Luka in different categories too. So this kid has so much overall potential to him and the fact that he's already doing this in just 10 games in his NBA career is honestly scary to see he's going places for sure and he's done it all at a very efficient rate and so the more that he becomes seasoned the more he gets an understanding of how the NBA works and you know the more he grows and the more that he gets comfortable with you know his body against NBA elite players He's only going to get better, and I think the fact that he's already at this platform is very interesting to see and very exciting to see as well. He could be something very special. Um, these two teams, talking about the Thunder and the Pelicans, have faced off three times already before this, and each time before, the Thunder had won. Three of those games, they won them by five points or less. So in hindsight, I probably should have predicted that the Thunder would have won the game just based on those results. But I was staying loyal, and I'm, I was thinking that, you know, there's no way the Pelicans are going to get swept in the regular season matchup. I'm a sucker. I'm an absolute sucker. The next game that Zion would be a participant in would be the Rising Stars game between Team World and Team USA. So we break down that game coming up next. Check out the show that's built on the MMA. From the UFC to extreme cage fighting, they got the fights covered. Check out the GSMC MMA podcast. Get the latest news on past or upcoming fights. Join us as we talk to and about some of the biggest names in the MMA, past, present, and future. When it's the fight game, there's just one show to check out. GSMCpodcast.com backslash MMA dash podcast. Don't forget to like them on Facebook and follow them on Twitter. Visit G. GSMCpodcast.com for more info. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about 
the Oklahoma City Thunder beating the New Orleans Pelicans, much to my dismay, because I predicted that the Pelicans would win the game. Fortunately for them, they didn't have Brandon Ingram, their highest scorer. He's been out with an ankle injury. Um, so that definitely hurt them. Also, the fact that the Thunder are just more experienced in terms of crunch time games. They had the lead for the majority of the game, lost it for a bit in the fourth quarter, but veteran presence is like Chris Paul, who runs an offense like nobody else, and Gallinari, who really just closed out the game, pushed them over the top. And I think that inexperience from the Pelicans kind of hurt them in the end. Also, we talked about how Zion Williamson had a new career high at 32 points and how he's in elite company with people that have done incredible things within the first 10 games of their careers, like Michael Jordan, Shaquille O'Neal, Allen Iverson, and Luka Doncic. So he's in great company, and he's playing at an elite level already, only 10 games into his career. So he is somebody that is a rising star. And that was my poor attempt at transitioning to our next topic. Team World versus Team USA One of the first things happening All-Star Weekend, Rising Stars game, I had Team USA all the way. I mean, look at their squad. You got John Morant, who's arguably the Rookie of the Year. I mean, is that arguably at this point? I mean, Zion is playing really impressive, but John Morant's been crazy. I mean, he's led the Grizzlies to an eighth-place seed where people thought maybe they would be last in the Western Conference. You got Colin Sexton, who is on a really poor team, but he's almost averaged 20 points. Devontae Graham, who's having a breakout year, playing really well. Uh, Pascal, probably one of the bright spots for the Golden State Warriors. Not a great team this year, obviously, but he's getting a lot of extended minutes, a lot of experience, and he's playing really well with those minutes. Jaron Jackson Jr., um, the running mate for John Morant, um, having a breakout year too, really getting a, a grasp of how the NBA game works. Kendrick Nunn, Trey Young, uh, if he plays, like I said, uh, Tyler Hero, Zion Williamson. I mean, this team is stacked. So, of course, it went with Team USA. They just had more star power, in my opinion, rising star power. And it just looked like, on paper, they should win this game, no doubt. Now, basically, this game is a junior all-star game. So, can't really expect a lot of defense or can't expect a lot of high competition, even if it is against some of the best young talent in the NBA. No one really wants to try because it's supposed to be like a vacation. It's supposed to be a break, what have you. That's pretty much what I expect from this game. It's just not a lot of high competition. Now, side note, all weekend long for All-Star Weekend, Kobe Bryant was being recognized and honored, which I thought was phenomenal to see. Trey Young um, in this particular game was wearing custom sneakers with Mamba on one and Mamba Sita on the other for... Um, G.G. Bryan, Gianna Bryan, who also passed away in that helicopter crash, among seven others. Um, but it was good, a good uh, tribute to them. And him and Luca, and Trey Young and Luca, really highlighted this matchup. And the two of them had a lot of fun on the court. You could visibly see it. It was, it was cool to see because, you know, it kind of helps you step away from that competitiveness that they, they have in an 82-game grueling season. This is a time where they can really appreciate each other's stardom and really have a lot of fun with what they're doing. And so it was really cool to see these two teams, or these two players especially, kind of butt heads because, you know, these two have been compared since, you know, their rookie year. And now they're in their sophomore year. They're constantly compared and constantly in competition with each other from afar. So to see them on two teams against each other was fun to see. The best part especially was at the end of the half, Trey was yelling at Luca, saying, don't pass the ball. Don't pass, just shoot it. And so Luca pulled up from half and he nailed it. It was a great, great shot from deep, but the greatest shot was a camera shot of the two watching it travel in the air and getting knocked down. Their reactions were hilarious and just so genuine, so pure. And it was really, really great to see. At halftime, surprisingly enough, at least to me, was that Team World had the lead. At halftime, 81 to 71. Didn't see that coming, obviously, because I said Team USA all the way. Um, Funny moment, though. Before the end of the half was when Zion ended up dunking the ball. And when he dunked the ball, he ended up bending the rim. And they had to fix it. (laughs) The legend of him being a high flyer and a huge dunker already 
was being furthered by showing his strength. I mean, kid's pretty heavy set. I mean, you have so many NBA stars that are huge, heavy set, dunk the ball on a consistent base, basis, but you don't really see the rim getting bent out of shape usually. And Zion Williamson did that, which I thought was crazy. Um, but like, like I said, 81-71 at halftime for Team World. And so Miles Bridges of Team USA, during the halftime break, took to Twitter. He tweeted saying, all right, bet, which means like, okay, cool, let's, let's, let's go, let's get, let's get this going. Um, he also put uh, a couple pictures, the first one of a person playing video games kind of leaning back, and then the other picture was the person playing video games leaning forward. So this is video game knowledge. If you're not a gamer, you probably don't know what I'm talking about, but when you're leaning back playing video games, you're not really trying. But if you lean forward, that means it's go time. You're going to start trying. So this is what Miles Bridges is saying. He said, all right, bet. I'm going to start trying. Let's start getting this going because this team is down 10. I thought this was very fitting and something he followed up on. Team World had a 12-point lead early in the third. And then the second unit of Team USA, mostly led by Bridges and Pascal, went in a, on a 27-5 to run. They went off. Miles Bridges capped it all off with a huge slam he had thrown down to himself off the backboard, kind of showing off a bit. And with Team USA taking a huge lead and the game essentially being over, a dunk contest broke out in the middle of the game in the last minute of this game. Zion did a really nice 360 windmill dunk that saw it thrown off the back iron, so he missed it, but it would have been a 50 if he had completed it. So because he missed it, everyone kind of walked around, gave him the ball again to redeem himself. And so, okay, I just missed the dunk. I'm Zion Williamson. I need to, I need to live up to my name, and I need to get this second attempt. So on a, a second attempt, he threw it off the glass, tried to put it between his legs and slam it down with one hand, but he couldn't pull it off. He missed again. He, he didn't even get close on this one. He completely missed. So a little embarrassing at this point, two missed dunks right away. Brandon Clark of Team World then went down the other way and did the 360 windmill and did it with ease. So kind of like some shade to Zion, like that really wasn't that difficult. I got it done. (laughs) And then Zion, they were pushing him to do it. He he went for another third attempt, dunk number three, third time's a charm, right? So he took his time, really took his time. Like he was moving really slowly, kind of walked. It looked like a travel, but obviously the refs aren't going to call it at this point because None of them are really playing at this point. Um, And so he goes up. He went 360 through the legs, and he clanked it off the back iron and missed again. That's three potential dunks that he could have had in a dunk contest, and he missed all three. I mean, come on, Zion. I definitely expected more from him. His old teammate, RJ Barrett, then went down the other way and pulled a double-clutch reverse dunk, so... It wasn't the most extravagant dunk to pull off, but it went through the hoop, Zion Williamson. I mean, that's some shade right there. I mean, just make make the dunk. Lastly, Jaw threw the ball in the air from the three-point line and followed it on the bounce. He put it behind his back and went to slam it down with one hand, but he missed two, but that would have been nice if he had finished that. That would be a really nice dunk. I'd give that one a 50. Brandon Clark in garbage time went for another dunk. Um, he missed two, though, so all these young players have work to do before they can graduate and join a real dunk contest, clearly. <laughs> but Team USA ends up taking the win, 151-131. So with this being the sixth year of this competition between Team World and Team USA, both teams now have three wins. And so making my prediction correct, Team USA took the game. Um, the MVP of this game was, in fact, Miles Bridges. He had 20 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists with 3 steals. So once he came out of the halftime locker, he really started trying, took over the game. He was a big reason why the team made the turn and take over. Um, I think this was kind of a robbery, though, in my opinion. Eric Pascal of the Warriors had 23 points. He outscored Bridges. And he he shot the ball 10 of 13. So he was super efficient. Um... And then he also led all scorers on Team USA. So how didn't he get the MVP? And the reason why I think he didn't get it is because he just wasn't flashy enough, whereas Bridges was throwing windmill dunks and 360 dunks and just 
making more of a show. And so I guess in that aspect, sure, give it to him, whatever. But if you're talking about efficiency, most points, Pascal probably should have gotten the MVP, kind of robbed. Um, Zion Williamson had 14 points, two rebounds, one assist um, on 7-11 of shooting, but three of those misses on that 7-11 shooting <laughs> were because of his missed dunk attempt. So other than that, he would have been 7 for 8, which is a lot more efficient. Trey Young had 18 points, four rebounds, seven assists with a steal. His biggest highlights were, of course, from downtown. He shot the ball from deep over Barrett at one point and another from the side of midcourt, so just really showing off his range. John Morant had 10 points, five rebounds, six assists. He threw four alley-oop passes to Zion Williamson, so that would be an interesting pairing to see, really fun to see as well. Um, and another, he threw it to his usual running mate, Jaron Jackson Jr. He also had some high-flying dunks of his own as well. Luka Doncic had 16 points, 5 rebounds, and a steal. Um, he was 4 for 9 from 3-point land. Obviously, he wasn't going full speed. He's pretty much walking around half the time. Um, and then he also had that half-court shot over Trey Young, which I thought was probably one of the best moments of the game. RJ Barrett led all scorers with 27 points, 6 rebounds, 5 assists, and 3 steals, but he got the L, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, Shea Gildrick Alexander had 16 points, 3 rebounds, 3 assists, 1 steal. Um, it was a rough outing from 3-point land. He was 1 for 6 from 3. And then Brandon Clark probably could have been MVP if Team World had won. He had 22 points, 8 boards with a steal. So he really showed up and showed out. Coming up next, we take a look at the Skills Challenge and 3-point contest. So find out who was crowned the winner of each. Stay with us. Check out the show built around the women of MMA. From the UFC to the extreme cage fighting, we got the fights covered. Listen. It's the Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. The latest news of upcoming fights, discussions of previous matches. Join us as we talk to and about the biggest names in women's mixed martial arts. Past, present, and future. When it's the women's fight game, you know where to listen to. The Golden State Media Concepts Women's MMA Podcast. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast, brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I'm your host, Isaiah Kiddos. We just talked about Team World taking on Team USA. I had Team USA all the way because they just seemed to have more star power. And through the first half, I was wrong. They were down 10. Um, but then Miles Bridges tweeted out saying, all right, bet. He's going to start trying now. And so he went off, ended up getting the MVP for Team USA. And they end up taking the game 151-131. The game really being a joke by the last two minutes of the game. Had an in-game dunk contest, basically, where Zion Williamson clanked three of them. Didn't even make any of them. So I'm very disappointed in that. He eventually, I'm sure, will be in the dunk contest. So he's got some work to do, for sure. But moving forward now, looking at the skills contest and the three-point contest. I did not make a prediction for the skills challenge. Because honestly... I forgot about it. <laughs> it's one of those that kind of just gets swept under the rug for me. Competing in this one was Patrick Beverly, um, which I thought was interesting because he's been injured for so long, so I didn't think he was going to actually participate. Uh, Spencer Dinwiddie, Shea Gilgis Alexander, uh, Chris Middleton. So those are mostly all, you know, the guards. So you would expect one of those to win. Uh, then there was Siakam. Adebayo, Sabonis, and defending champion Jason Tatum. So you would probably guess that either Tatum would return and win the win the whole thing again, or that one of the guards in Patrick Beverly, Dinwiddie, Alexander, or Milton would take this. So, like I said, I feel like this skills, skills challenge kind of gets swept under the rug. It's not as extravagant as it used to be. Nowadays, it's head to head, so I feel like there's less to do because before you would have to do 
stuff all over the court. You would have to saw them through, uh, def- like fake defenders, do a straight chest pass, a bounce pass, and I just felt like there's more to do. But in this one, you just go through the defenders, hit a pass straight through, no bounce or nothing, hit a layup, and then go down and hit a three pointer, which I think it just th- show all kinds of different. Uh, skills, I guess, but it just seems a little bit easier than in years past. The first matchup saw Bam versus Dinwiddie, and Adebayo didn't miss anything. His pass or nothing. He even nailed his three-pointer to eliminate Spencer right away. And then the second round, or not the second round, another matchup was Siakam versus Patrick Beverly, and I felt like Pat was honestly just messing around. He really wasn't trying, and he got eliminated super easily. Shea versus Middleton, Shea goes to Alexander. Um, Alexander, like all the other point guards so far, couldn't hit the pass. And so Middleton had time to miss one three and then nail the next one. So he, so Shea goes Alexander was out, Middleton move on. So bonus versus Tatum, let me remind you, Tatum is the defending champion. This is the closest matchup so far. Both ran up to the three-point line at the same exact time. Tatum really took his time and barely hit front iron. <laughs> Super short, and then Sabonis hit on his second attempt, eliminating the defending champion in the first round. Adebayo versus Siakam, they were neck and neck the entire time, and they both bricked their first three, but Adebayo was a quicker trigger, and he ended up knocking it down first, so he would head to the final, which I thought was crazy, Adebayo in the final of the skills challenge, really. Sabonis versus Middleton. Middleton, the last guard standing, they were neck and neck until Middleton lost the ball on the dribble. He lost the ball, dribbling the ball up the court to go lay it in. Like, what? How does that happen? Middleton would catch up after Sabonis missed his first shot. Middleton then missed his own. At one point, they both shot and canceled each other out. It was like knockout, making sure no one hit, got, got, got the shot down. And so Sabonis was just a little bit quicker than Middleton. He knocked it down to head to the final himself. So Sabonis versus Autobio in the skills competition final. <laughs> Who would have thought that this would have happened? I definitely wouldn't have guessed this. I'm glad I didn't make a prediction on this. I would have looked silly. Bam would be ahead but um, throughout it, but it would all come down to who hit the three first. And it ended up being Adebayo. So he became the first Heat player to win the skins, skills challenge for his, since Dwayne Wade. It's been a while. Adebayo has hit only one three this year in the regular season on 11 tries. But during the skills competition, he hit three to win it all. Betters had him last in this. They didn't expect him to win this at all. But he took it anyways. Now moving forward to the three-point contest, which is a little more interesting in my opinion. It was a little different this year. They added two different shots from basically 30 feet, um, called them the Mountain Dew shot. That's worth three points in addition to the normal spots. And they have a, a minute and 10 seconds now to do it, so they added 10 more seconds. Trey Young started out, and he's made the six most threes so far this season. Everyone knows he's one of the best elite three-point shooters in the league. But in a competition like this, I predicted that he would struggle, and he definitely did that early on. Announcers... We're kind of saying that he was gassed because he was moving really, really slowly. And when he ended up getting to his money rack, he had six seconds left and had to rush it. And at the end of the whole comp- competition for him, he scored 15. So not a good showing for him at all. Devontae Graham would be next. His first rack was super ugly. He airballed once, and he hit the side of the backboard on one. So people were wondering, how is this guy in three-point competition? But then he responded really well with his money rack on top of the key. He hit four or five of those. And then he hit the Mountain Dew shot. Um, He ended up with 18, so it wasn't great either, but he would obviously edge Trey Young by three. Next was Robinson, who I thought was going to win it all because of the way he's shot three this year. But he was clanking it early on. Only had five through the first three racks, so he's making me look real bad. Um, but he catches fire a bit late and ends up with 19, so he's now the leader um, in this competition. Devin Booker, late addition, because Damian Lillard was supposed to be in the competition, supposed to be in the All-Star game, but Dave, Devin Booker is going to take his place for both of those. So he would be up next um, 
At this point, all he would need is 15 to advance with Trey being the lowest. He ended up hitting both Mountain Dew balls en route to getting a 27. He went off. 27? I mean, the other highest score had 19, so you're making them look really bad. Buddy Heald, another person I had favorited for this comp- competition, was up next, and he was my lifeline now that Robinson was doing really poorly. He made the third most threes this season. All he needed to beat was 18, so that's light work for Buddy Heald, if you don't know. He was consistently hitting his shot despite missing both Mountain Dew shots, but he hit all of his money balls on his last rack to score 27 as well, so he tied with Devin Booker at 27. I thought that was crazy. Bertans would go next, and he would need 19. He was 1 for 5 on his first rack, but little by little, he kind of caught his rhythm. He hit a Mountain Dew shot and then went straight into his money rack, where he hit all of them to already get what he needed. But then with the last rack, he pushed his score to 26. So now it's Devin Booker and Buddy Heal to 27, and Bertans to 26. So Levine up next, he obviously would need 26. He had the hometown love with Chicago and he, because obviously the All-Star weekend is in Chicago. So he was getting that, that vibe, getting that extra motivation. And he hit every single shot on his first rack. So you're starting to think, oh no, here comes Levine to, to crash the party. But then he kind of went cold for a bit in the middle and in the second rack, missed the Mountain Dew shot, the third rack. Um, and he missed both of the Mountain Dew shots. And he only hit two on his money rack before making all of his shots on the last rack. So he finished really strong, but he was just shy, ended up with 23, so he was eliminated. Harris, the defending champion, would finish up round one. Again, needing 26, so he would end up being shy as well. He got 22 on this one. So heading to the finals is Buddy, Book, and Bertans. Triple Bs, big ballers? Where's Lonzo at? Where's LeVar Ball at? (laughs) But in the final, Bertans went first, and he started off pretty slow, other than hitting a Mountain Dew shot. Then he hit four for five on his money balls and finished strong with a score of 22. But going against Buddy and Booker, probably not going to be enough. Devin Booker was up next. He hit four or five at one rack and then missed a few. Went four or five at another rack and hit a Mountain Dew shot, and then hit four or five again, leading to his money rack already at 20. Then he only hit three of his five money racks for 26 points, one shy of his first round score. And that's still very impressive. And to have a score of 26, that puts a lot of pressure on Buddy Heald. So, Buddy, up against the odds. After starting off slow, he hit all of his shots at his second rack, he only missed two shots that weren't the Mountain Dew shots for 19 heading into his money rack. He hit his first three for 25. He missed one. And so on the last shot, it was either take it home or lose. And he hit it. He hit it for a score of 27 on the last shot to beat Booker by one point. Buddy Heald from Sacramento Kings. No one would have guessed it. So much fun to watch. Players and analysts' reactions were awesome. And then at the end of the day, Buddy dedicated it to the people who died during the Hurricane Dorian last fall. And he just hoped that it could bring some positivity for the people in his homeland in the Bahamas who are still recovering from that storm. He was saying how anything is possible. He's got the Mamba mentality. He kind of gave a nice tribute to Kobe Bryant as well. And I thought for it to go down to the last shot was just so much fun to watch. Those two Obviously, both great scorers, great three-point shooters. But Buddy Heald, I don't think a lot of people had him pegged as the winner. Um, I definitely knew he had the possibility to go on and win. I obviously leaned towards Robinson just because I thought he had a, he's had a better year so far. Clearly, I was wrong. Buddy Heald, congratulations. On the last shot, too, just makes it that much more fun. And then in similar fashion to three-point contest, being highly entertaining going down to the wire, It was the same story for the dunk contest. We talk about that coming up next. Tired of searching the vast jungle of podcasts? Now listen close and hear this out. There's a podcast network that covers just about everything that you've been searching. The Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network is here. 
Nothing less than a podcast bliss with endless hours of podcast coverage. From news, sports, music, fashion, cooking, entertainment, fantasy, football, and so much more. So stop lurking around and go straight out to the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. Guaranteed to fill that podcast itch. Whatever it may be, visit us at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter and download us on iTunes, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about the skills challenge being a big man affair. It was Sabonis and Adebayo in the finals, which I thought was absolutely insane because I did not expect that. Adebayo taking it home. For some betters, he was placed last. So for him to take home the, the trophy was huge for him. And then in three-point contest, some poor outings from some players I expected a lot from, like Robinson, Trey Young doesn't matter buddy book and bertans were in the final three bertans went first had a nice score of 22 but against buddy and book it's gonna be tough booker put up a 26 putting a lot of pressure on buddy healed and it went down to the very last ball and that buddy healed needed to hit and he hit it scar scored 27 to beat booker by one point and become the three-point contest winner of 2020 which i thought was pretty cool to see very cool to see uh it was a great contest went down to the wire and in similar fashion the dunk contest went down to the wire as well the participants in this one were dwight howard superman coming back after winning in 2008 lost in 2009 if you can't remember to nate robinson great dunk competition pat Connaughton of the bucks first time in this competition trying to make a name for himself Derek Jones Jr. would return. He got edged out in 2017 where he came in second place. So he definitely wants some revenge. And then Aaron Gordon. He got second in 2016 to Zach Levine. Possibly the greatest dunk contest of all time in my opinion. I think he got robbed. Some of the dunks he pulled off were absolutely insane. And I said last podcast, he deserves it. He got robbed and he needs his redemption. I mean... If you can't remember some of those dunks that he did in 2016, go check it out again because the man is just very creative, <laughs> had his mascot twirling, had you know a dunk where he jumped over somebody, had his legs horizontal in the air, put the ball underneath, underneath his legs, and then dunked it down. I mean, some of these dunks are just incredible, and he got absolutely robbed. So for me... That's who I was going with in this competition. My prediction was that he was going to come back with a vengeance and get his rightful trophy. So that was my prediction going into this. And so the first one up would be Dwight Howard. It was pretty underwhelming um, in real time, but in slow motion, okay. It it was a little better, I suppose. But either way, not super impressive. He, uh, He jumps up, spreads out his arms with his back to the bucket. Gives a big smile for the camera and then slowly turns his body and dunks it with one hand. And for me, that's kind of just a warm-up dunk. Uh, They gave him a 41 for that one. Jones was up next. He jumped over his teammate Adebayo, which is pretty impressive. Adebayo's a big guy. And he slammed it down with one hand. It seemed like it was pretty easily done. Um, May have pushed off a bit too off his shoulder with one hand. Um, looked like he could have cleared it easily, but just had his hand in the way, I guess. Um, but this was also a warm-up dunk, in my opinion, too. He got a 46 for that one. Conniff Tin's first dunk was interesting. First of all, his fit was what caught my eye. He was wearing a backwards hat, a t-shirt, and I don't even know, like some board shorts or something. It obviously wasn't a basketball uniform. I don't know what he was wearing. Anyway, he had Christian Yelich, a baseball player, underneath the hoop holding a basketball. So he's bringing some all-star power, MVP power, to this competition. Uh, he jumped over him, 
grabbed the ball and slammed it down with two hands. So it was decent. I mean, not super eye-catching, but he got a 45 for that warm-up dunk. Aaron Gordon, he missed his first attempt, but he was trying something tougher than all the others, so I was okay with it. He went reverse through the legs, so that means he brought it from the back to the front, and then he did a reverse slam with his uh, with two hands on his very first dunk. So he set the standard right there. That wasn't a warm-up dunk. He got a deserved 50 on this one. Great dunk. The n- next up was Dwight Howard, a.k.a. Superman. And the reason why I'm mentioning that again is because he brought out the cape again. And a special tribute to Kobe Bryant as well with a 24 over the S um, on his chest for Superman, of course. Um, so nice little shout-out to Kobe Bryant in his dunk. He had someone throw it over to him over the backboard, so they were behind the basket. And he ran up, jumped, caught it, and slammed it down. And it wasn't really anything special in my opinion. He did fly, though. I mean, he was in the air for a long time, had a lot of hang time, kind of gave a little bit of a cock back and threw it down. But I feel like they gave him more love than they should have. I didn't think that this was that impressive, but he got a 49 somehow. (laughs) Definitely didn't deserve that in my opinion. Connaughton's next jump would be pretty impressive. He would jump over someone again. This time over his teammate, Mr. Attentacumpo. Another MVP from basketball this time. (laughs) It was almost identical to the first dunk, uh, except this time he got the ball in two hands. And after he jumped over Giannis, he got the ball in two hands, hit the backboard first with the ball in his hand. So smacked it off the backboard, came back off, and then slammed it down. He got a 50, which I think was deserving because I've never seen anyone bounce it off the backboard and then slam it down. Like, that's pretty impressive to do. That means he must have had a lot of hang time. And jumping over Giannis, too, that, <laughs> that's really well done. Jones needed a big one to stay alive, and he completely brought the heat. Get it? Because he's a heat player? Terrible joke, but very, very good dunk. <laughs> he went 360 through the legs, and moved it to the side that was falling away from the basket, and he was still able to slam it down with one hand, that's tough. And I mean, my description does not do it justice at all, much like a lot of these dunks probably won't, but he got a 50 on this one. Very great dunk. Aaron Gordon then brought out Chance the Rapper, who was holding the ball above his head. Gordon cleared him easily past past the hoop. He was going past the hoop, and then got the ball in his right hand, and reached back to the outside of his body to slam it down as he's passing the hoop. That was so smooth, so he deserved, He got another deserved 50. The final would end up being Aaron Gordon versus Derek Jones Jr. Jones' next dunk, he would jump over two people, put it between his legs, and slam it down with one hand, which he got a 50 for. Gordon would follow up by doing a similar dunk to his last. He would have Chance, the rapper, again, hold the ball over his head. This time, he was jumping from the right side to the left of the hoop. He cleared Chance effortless, effortlessly, grabbed it with his right hand, and went across his body this time, so into the inside, to slam it down while he was drifting away from the bucket, and he got another 50. So they had to keep dunking. They just had to keep going. It was basically who was going to not have 50. Jones would have someone throw it off the backboard, and he jumped over said person, put it between his legs, and slammed it down with one hand. I don't know if I've ever seen that, where you get it off the backboard, and then you put it through your legs before you slam it down. I'm not sure if I've seen that before, so that was a really tough dunk for him to pull off. He got a 50, so Gordon, obviously, in turn, would need a 50 as well. He missed his first attempt, but let me tell you, What he was attempting was about to be amazing. Markel Fultz was throwing it off the side of the backboard, and he caught it with one hand while being sideways to the basket. He he continued his twirl, completing a 360, while also windmilling the basketball to slam it down with one hand. The motion was so fluid, so effortless. If you look up any of these dunks that I've described, look at this one. Quite possibly the greatest dunk I've ever seen so pretty so effortless he got obviously got a 50 on this one I mean it was a fantastic dunk Jones next would get a pass off the side of the backboard as well 
that he would catch put between his legs, of course, because if you haven't noticed by now, he goes between the legs on every single one of his dunks, and he slammed it down on a windmill with one hand. So that's tough, but he still keeps doing the same things in my opinion, but he did get another 50. Gordon jumped over Chance again, but this time getting it, putting it between his legs and then slamming it down with one hand. Another 50, so will this ever end is the question I have to ask. Jones with his next jump, he jumped just in front of the free throw line where he soared to the basket and did a windmill dunk. And they gave him a 48 for that one. So finally, the trend of getting 50s finally ends. And so Gordon had gotten 50 on every single dunk thus far. So this was in the bag, right? Aaron Gordon is finally getting his trophy. He pulled out a fan favorite, Taco Fall, if you don't remember him. He's the seven five foot dude on the Boston Celtics. Fans love him, and he's just crazy tall. And so Aaron Gordon pulled him out to dunk over. Aaron Gordon cleared him and slammed it down with two hands. He cleared a seven foot five tall guy. It looked like maybe he caught him, like not cleanly, but it was actually Taco's hands that were propelled over his head that got pulled down. So that's insane. He ends up getting a 47 for this dunk, meaning Derrick Jones Jr. wins. My man Aaron Gordon got robbed again. Again, he should have had two trophies by now. This is complete bogus. I mean, he hit 50s in every single round but one. But one, and that's ridiculous. And jumping over Taco Fall, you give him a 47? How? How? He jumped over a 7 foot five guy got a 50 in every single other round and that's how you make him lose by giving him one less point than Derek jones jr come on players took to twitter to voice their disgust much like i am right now lebron saying two trophies should have been awarded which maybe would have been a better solution because these two were inseparable and bead saying that gordon was robbed i very much agree joel Embiid. Terrence Ross saying that Gordon can have his trophy because he's just totally heated. Candace Parker, who was one of the judges, said that they all meant to make it a tie, but someone, quote unquote, went against the idea and messed it up. My conspiracy theory is that Dwayne Wade may have rigged it because he's a heat guy and so is Jones. So I don't know. That's just me being very upset with this situation. I feel so bad for Aaron Gordon because... He said himself that he feels like he should have two trophies right now. And he said, no, I'm, that's it. I'm done with the dunk contest. That's three tries and two of them in which he should have won. So many people upset with that, including me. It's just such a robbery. Heartbreaking. Ugh. But coming up next, we're going to talk about the biggest event, Team Giannis versus Team LeBron, and break down how that went, how the new format looked, and all that good stuff. So... Stay with us. Are you looking to get your college football fix? Looking to get the latest news on your favorite school's team? The GSMC College Football Podcast is your ticket to all things college football. Join us as we talk college football from the national championship, the college rivalries, the bowl game, to the Heisman Trophy, to which conference is the best. We've got you covered for the Big Ten, SEC, Big 12, the Pac-12, ACC, and everything in between. Download the GSMC College Football Podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, Google Play, or anywhere you find podcasts. Just type GSMC in the search bar. Welcome back to the GSMC Basketball Podcast. We just talked about the dunk contest that was very and highly entertaining this year between Aaron Gordon and Derek Jones Jr. Another great matchup for the ages. They're going toe-to-toe, getting 50s back and forth before Derek Jones Jr. got a 48. And then you think Aaron Gordon, who had gotten 50 on every single one of his dunks beforehand, 
was there's no way he wasn't going to win this. He jumped over Taco Fall for his last dunk, a seven foot five player on the Boston Celtics. That's a tough player to clear, first of all. And he cleared him, no problem. Dunked it down. They gave him a 47. They gave my man a 47. Derek Jones Jr. is the winner of the dunk contest. Aaron Gordon got robbed again. Tell me different. Try to change my mind. I won't believe you. Anyway, I don't want to get into it again. Very upset still. Moving forward, talking about the All-Star game. First things first, it was announced that the MVP of this game that hadn't been named beforehand is now named. It would be the first... Um, person to receive the newly renamed trophy, the Kobe Bryant All-Star Trophy. Very cool little tribute to the late Kobe Bryant by Adam Silver. He said it was very fitting. Just a good way for them to um, recognize him and appreciate him in that aspect. So I thought it was very cool. Kobe Bryant was the youngest player to play in an All-Star game at 19. He holds the record for the most consecutive selections with 18. Um, there was one year where the NBA lockout didn't have an all-star game. So that's why he didn't have just consecutive, consecutive all-star selections. And then he's also tied for the most MVPs in an all-star game with four. So very fitting that he, the trophy is named after him, in my opinion. Team LeBron versus Team Giannis. In this game, they didn't have the players wear their respective numbers. Instead, Team LeBron wore number two, which was Gianna Bryant's number also passed away in that helicopter crash with her father Kobe Bryant and seven others and team Giannis wore 24 Kobe Bryant's second number obviously so good tribute to them in that sense as well I ridiculed Giannis about his picks I mean completely tore him apart because Giannis is very good at a lot of things and in my opinion not very good at picking teams um, I said that he would get completely mopped and it wouldn't even be close in the new format LeBron, in this format, both teams had to pick uh, some charities to play for, and LeBron picked Chicago Scholars, an organization that helps low-income students get to and through college. And Team Giannis picked After School Matters, Maggie Daly, formerly Chicago's first lady and wife to Mayor Richard M. Daly, wanted a way to keep her children busy after school and during summer, so that's how that program started. So each of the first three quarters would start at 0-0, each time fighting for the chance to win $100,000 for their respected charities. And so kicking this off, these first few quarters felt how the All-Star game usually feels, just very free-flowing, kind of messing around, half-trying, and a lot of dunks, of course. In these star-studded lineups, there'd be nine players making their all-star game debuts, which I thought was really cool. It just shows the evolution of the league and shows that there's a lot of up-and-coming talent in the NBA. Um, In the very first quarter of this new format, it was Kawhi Leonard, who stood out the most going 4 for 4 from downtown to lead all scorers with 12 points, and Team LeBron took the quarter 53-41. And I'm over here thinking... Duh. I mean, Team LeBron is just so much better. It's like not even fair. And so I thought, you know, I'm feeling pretty good about my prediction so far. Giannis is going to get mopped. The highest score in the first for Giannis was Adebayo with eight. And then Giannis and Kemba both had six. But then after that, no more, no player had more than four points. So very slow start for Giannis. LeBron, AD, Kawhi, and even Ben Simmons were getting into it already. They were playing really well. Um, with Kawhi, obviously, like I said, carrying the team. I figured at this point, they're about to run away with it. They win $100,000 for their charity in this first quarter easily. Then, (laughs) all of a sudden, in the second quarter, the tables completely flip. Completely. Kawhi did stay hot. He added another 13, but he was it. No one else scored more than five on Team LeBron. Giannis one-upped Kawhi Leonard and had 14 in this quarter along with nine from Lowry for Giannis to take this quarter 51 to 30 giving him a 92 to 83 lead at halftime this is the point where I entered in my household and I turned on the tv and said okay I'll catch the last half of the all-star game I wonder how much LeBron's up at this point and then I saw that Giannis is leading at halftime I was astounded absolutely astounded Booker did announce himself in this in this second quarter, though, with a tough putback jam. 
that was really nice to see because obviously his first All Star appearance, he's pretty, you know, peeved about the fact that he wasn't picked initially, even without Damian Lillard being hurt. And I agree with him. And then also this quarter did see Chris Paul connect for an alley oop. I didn't even know that man could dunk. I really didn't. So to see him catch an alley oop and dunk it down, pretty interesting to see. Trey Young ended that half uh, with a half quarter to really put salt in the wounds of Team LeBron. And his team completely um, tackled him and stuff and just thought it was really cool because he had Luka shoot a shot over him from half court in the Rising Stars game. So it was his turn to hit a half court shot, which I thought was pretty cool to see. The third would be just like the last quarter that started at zero. Um, But having already tallied the scores, LeBron was behind by nine, obviously. So that's kind of in the back of their minds. There was nice plays from Kemba with a behind-the-back pass to Embiid who went and hit a windmill dunk. Joel Embiid maybe should join the dunk contest one of these days. LeBron also had to drive down the lane where he faked a uh, behind-the-back pass, but he ended up keeping it on the dribble, so it was a behind-the-back dribble, and then he slammed it down, so it was a super deceptive play, super nice. Uh, Trey Young threw a crazy underhand shovel pass to Gobert, who caught it and reverse slammed it down. I didn't think he had that kind of ability to him. And then Tatum had a nice no-look over the shoulder pass to Ben Simmons for the fast break slam. So these all-stars really showing what they got and and all over the court as well. I mean, this is what the all-star game's all about. And especially in the quarter quarters where they're not really trying yet, it's cool to break out some some fancy passes and stuff. LeBron had 10 in this quarter, but Gobert actually led all scores with 14. And at the end of the third, it was tied, 41-41. So that money that could be won at the end of each quarter was being rolled over to the next quarter. So winner takes all. And because it was tied, Team Giannis was still up by 9. Now, to remind you, with the new format, you take the cumulative score and add 24 to the team that's winning. So Giannis was ahead at that point. You had 24 to his score, and the target score became 157. So first team to that wins the game. Clock turned off. I thought this was a great way for them to play. Giannis obviously had the lead, obviously had the advantage. The point of this format was to increase the competitiveness, and let me tell you, it was extremely competitive. Like, playoff-level competitive. People playing defense, taking charges, going for blocks. Both teams actually had a challenge in this. I mean, it was crazy to see. It was really fun to watch. There was one play where LeBron was 1v1 versus Giannis. Giannis stayed step for step with him and then was just completely covering LeBron. So LeBron tried to gain some separation by pushing off a bit and then went for a fadeaway that Giannis actually ended up blocking, which I thought was really cool. And then on an ensuing possession, AD tried to take it to the rack, and Giannis rejected him there too. AD would eventually lay it in, but Giannis was playing some tough defense down the stretch. Team LeBron eventually tied it, came all the way back, um, tied it at 150-150, and just a reminder, the target score is 157, so both teams seven points away from winning. LeBron would take the lead again, Finally, 152-150 from a lob from him to AD. And then Embiid took it down and hit a really nice post move. He had LeBron on him in in the post, and he faked one way with his shoulder. And then LeBron fell for it, completely went that way. And then Embiid faded away the other way. Very clean move. Looked great. Two hard and free throws made it 154-152. And so at this point, a three could win it for LeBron. The next few possessions would be totally crazy with both teams taking ill-advised shots, turning the ball over, and with it being 154-153 at this point, LeBron drove to the lane, and Giannis went for the block. Initially, it was called goaltending, but Team Giannis used a challenge in the All-Star game, and it was a successful challenge. It was a clean block, so that took away the goaltending charge back to 154-153. On that possession, they they won the jump. LeBron's team won the jump. And he basically pulled up from half court to try and win the game. And that barely missed, so that would have been a cool way to end the game for sure. And then Harden for Team LeBron, 1v1 against Lowry. He pushed off against Lowry and hit a three, but not before getting called for a charge. So that could have been a potential game winner as well, but didn't come off because Lowry 
drew a charge in an all-star game. Who would have thought? LeBron would finally score himself to make it 156-153, and then Embiid hit two free throws to make it 156-155, so at this point, next point wins. With a matchup problem down low for Team Giannis, seeing Lowry on AD, LeBron threw it into AD, obviously, and Lowry was called for a foul, seeing Anthony Davis go to the line for the chance to win the game. Anthony Davis later said he missed the first free throw on purpose to make more suspense in the arena and put more pressure on himself. But then he made his second and iced the game, won the game. And so off a free throw, I thought that was pretty lame. I mean, you know, street rules. Win by an actual bucket. You can't win at the free throw line. I feel like if he was a true competitor, he would have just missed both. It was a pretty lame way for it to end, but... It was a great game. So much fun to watch. Probably the most fun I've, I've had watching an All-Star game in a long time. And I think this new format works really well because it actually was extremely competitive. People were drawing charges and going up for blocks and being very physical. I was kind of surprised. At some points, I was thinking like, damn, they should probably chill out a little bit because they're going back to the regular season soon. But winning that quarter for LeBron... Gave them another 300k for their charity, 400k in total. Team Giannis's charity did get 100k, um, so both charities walked away with with money, which I thought was great. Um, Team Giannis more competitive than I thought. I gotta give him props. Um, I counted him out too soon. Obviously, he's got all stars on the team; they can be competitive. I didn't give him a nod, but I was right in the end. Team LeBron did win. Uh, Giannis had 25 points, 11 rebounds, and 3 blocks, so if he had 3 blocks, he obviously was trying pretty hard. Kemba had 23, Embiid had 22 and 10, Gobert had 21 and 11, and then Team LeBron was victorious. Three times in a row in this new format of captains where Team LeBron has won. Someone take out this man. Someone show up, become captain, and pick a better team than Giannis and beat him. Please, please. LeBron James had 23 in this one. Chris Paul had 23 in this one. Anthony Davis had 20 points, 9 rebounds. Simmons had 17. But Kawhi Leonard, 30 points, 7 rebounds, 4 assists with 2 steals, is the first ever recipient of the Kobe Bryant All-Star MVP Award. He said after how much it means to him, how much Kobe means to him, and how he dedicated to him. And it was a super fun All-Star game. Chris Paul was actually the one that suggested this new format, and I think it was very successful. Players, coaches, and I'm sure fans as well, because I loved it. They'll all, they'll all love it. So I see, I can definitely see it sticking around for sure. This could be a great way for the game to continue being competitive. And in its first trial run, I think it was very successful. I think they need to get rid of that rule that you can win on a free throw, because that was lame. But other than that, it was definitely fun to watch for sure. Great All-Star weekend. That's going to do it for this podcast. So... Thank you for listening to the GSMC Basketball Podcast brought to you by the GSMC Podcast Network. I would like to ask that you please remember to subscribe to the show and write a nice review because that really helps us out. Also, if you can please follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, I would greatly appreciate it. I'm Isaiah Kidos. Thank you all. See you next time. You've been listening to the Golden State Media Concepts Basketball Podcast, part of the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network. You can find this show and others like it at www.gsmcpodcast.com. Download our podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, and Google Play. Just type in GSMC to find all the shows from the Golden State Media Concepts Podcast Network from movies to music from sports to entertainment and even weird news you can also follow us on twitter and on facebook thank you and we hope you have enjoyed today's program